The latest sample clearance news is crazy. I don't know if you heard about this. An artist by the name of Trey Fuego just got sued by Sony for about a million dollars. A million dollars for using an uncleared sample in a song that he dropped when he was about 16 years old. Now that's a direct sample. You probably know about a recent song that I produced. It was last year, the year before, I don't know, Rodeo for La Pat. That included an interpolation of a Timberland produced hit song, Pony by Genuine. I just got word this morning that that song went gold. I've talked about how the splits broke down because it was an interpolation and not an actual direct sample of a recorded piece of music. But today I'm talking with Fatboy, who's a super producer, best known for his work with Gucci Mane. He did Wasted featuring Plies. That's an obvious hit. And he tells this crazy story about interpolating a hit song and then collaborating with DJ Mustard on it and what they had to go through to clear the sample. Check this out. Was that an expensive clearance? Did you have to take a big hit they ended up taking 60 percent of the record that was just me and mustard it's like yeah we'll, we'll all just we'll bust the 40 up this is the first time we've ever spoken actually um yep. but it's not the first time we've been in the same figurative space we were both yep. on the same album way back yep. way back young jeezy yep. the recession yep which is cool. I don't, I don't think that's how we linked. I think we just followed each other on social media or something. Yeah. Like yeah. But yeah. Um, was, was that, it was, that was my first big placement recession. That was 2008. Was, was that your first big placement or had you been doing this for a while? Before? My first big placement was with camouflage. Um, 2001 a record called cut friends. Um, that I actually started my career with, with camouflage. Um, his daughter, uh, is Fly J, um, that plays for LSU. Um, she's also a rapper, which her current new single with, uh, NLE Chopper, I produced that. So that's where my career started with him. Um, first deal that we got was in 2001 with Universal. So, um, that was my first, uh, major placement, 2001. Okay, so you said we got our deal with Universal. Were you involved beyond well, just him, being? I, yeah, I, I say we because you know that was a it, it was a family affair. Uh, Pure Pain Records, uh, Camouflage. It, it was Camouflage um, um, artist deal, but you know the label. You know it was a label situation, so it was kind of a, a partnership thing. Um, Pure Pain Records, Universal. So we the pure pain side of it, you know, um, even though, uh, the first deal was, uh, the artist deal for camouflage, but Word. before he got killed, it was supposed to go into, you know, other things, the full label deal and everything. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely like the name of that, that label imprint. What, what was the track you did on little Wayne, no ceilings? Um, well, actually it was, um, it was, oh man, I, I can't think of the... I know it was a beat that you had done for someone else that he, that he redid. Yeah, uh, but what, what remix was it? Oh man, I can't, you know, I, damn, it's on the spot. <laughs> and I can't remember, you know what? We have... I was hoping to get clear, because I looked it up and I couldn't... Uh, I, I, mean, I was a little lazy with the research, I'm not going to lie, but... No, no, man, look, man, it, it was... Um, that record, let's see, Wasted, uh, and I'll tell you exactly what it is because they have it on uh, Who Sampled. So, um, yeah, shout out to Who Sampled. Let's see, Lil Wayne, it was Lil Wayne, Wasted, No Ceilings, I guess. Okay, with Wasted. Yeah. So, I think I remember that because I think people were requesting the, the Lil Wayne version. Because uh, we're both DJs, so I think a lot of people were requesting that um, yeah. in, in the clubs, too, because well, it was Wayne and, like, No Ceilings was really the height of his uh, his, his mixtape uh, run, I, I think. I think that's, that's yeah. fair to say. Yeah, yeah. It actually, it, it actually, we actually used it for the uh, official remix um, for, for the single. So, and uh, we just added, we added... Um, uh, I think uh, Birdman, Birdman jumped on it, um, Jadakiss, and 
And for some reason, I, I think it was one more person. But uh, yeah, we, we ended up making his verse from No Ceilings, the official remix, and just added kiss a kiss verse uh, and a Birdman verse. See, and that, that's crazy because that was a very different time when yeah. people were just jumping on industry beats and, and remixing and everyone loved it. But you couldn't really monetize that in any way. I mean, nowadays, yeah. I think you can monetize more directly because yeah, yeah. you could have put in some sort of like microsync claim on that and, and collected money. And maybe they they could have negotiated with the with um, Atlantic Records and gotten some kind of clearance to drop that on the on the streaming platforms. And then you could have gotten paid twice, like, like what happened with um, J. Cole and, and Drake. Yeah. Well, you, you, you actually you actually hit a nail on the head because uh, during COVID, they did end up going back and monetizing all that. They actually did. And, uh, you know, Thursday night uh, football, you know, Prime has the, um, the Thursday night football thing where um, after the game, there it, it might be a performance from an artist. I had to actually clear that. Um, for Wayne, uh, because he did a show and it was in the set. So, um, and around that time, that was right after. So this, this might have been 21, maybe might have been 21, right after that, 21 or 22, but right after, right after, um, they monetized everything that, that happened with the Wayne version and everything. He did that right after that, so I had to clear it right after that. So yeah, it did. It, it, it did. It did come back, and you know, a lot of monies from his version of everything started coming through. So what did it, that look like? Getting you know, be, a lot of producers are on one end of the clearance process. They're the ones doing the sampling, not the ones um, from whom artists are requesting clearance. What did that look like on your end? Um, as far as Wayne asking for the clearance for that performance yeah what kind of what kind of clearance did you have to give what what was that process like um well, that process was um they contacted sony um where i have you know um admin with um and the terms of it uh was something like uh two years uh it was it was actually three or four at first uh, and then they cut it down uh, to two years um, for the use of it and for Prime to, you know, um, Amazon to run it however they uh, saw fit. Um, but it was it was it was it was fairly simple. Um, they came in with the terms. Uh, I agreed to the terms. Uh, it was a it was a, a one time upfront fee. Um, and I think that. That fee might have been like uh, 10K or something like that uh, to clear it. And this was handled through your, your publishing admin yeah. because at this point, the record, Atlantic Records owns the master to that song. Right. And you still retained your 50% or whatever equity in the underlying composition. Right. Like this, these are the types of stories that make it real. Yeah. Because I, 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 I'm just always trying to beat IP law over producers heads when i make these videos because i feel like once you know what i mean once you understand the difference between the two copyrights what they mean how you can get paid off of them how to exploit them and and the the um fact that you own them by default as the creator of that beat suddenly you've basically unlocked the majority of the music business and every time oh man any deal comes your way you're already prepared because you are aware of these very, in, in a way, it's the simplest business on the planet because it's just yeah. two copyrights, how you exploit them. But I think the industry complicates them. And then a lot of producers' heads start spinning and they just don't retain that information yeah. and they get confused. But I think yeah. a lot of the confusion yeah. comes from yeah. just like... Yeah, it's, it, all, it comes down to just a fundamental lack of understanding of those two copyrights and what they are. Yeah. Because you know, like, uh, you'll hear people talk about, oh, yeah... Um, the labels got the mechanical rights. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mechanical? No, that's not how that works. It's just people conflate mechanical rights with master ownership, uh, it, and it, they it, think publishing is the same as is um, 
I, I don't know. It's it's two copyrights, different royalty streams. Just, just there are charts out there that explain it. I'm always showing one chart. Yeah, and 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 I re I remember, I remember you posting something, um, like you do on uh on Twitter X, <laughs> like I do. Yep. <laughs> you know, because because you, you you're all you're, you're always posting some some knowledge about the business, something something that's factual, and I see you get a lot of pushback on you know like like you don't know what you're talking about and. You brought up something about uh, it was something about sample clearance, um, and I think this was the first time you know because I, I I every day I, I see you post something knowledgeable. Um, I don't always say anything because you know most of the time you you know you got it you got it handled. This particular day, uh, you posted something about sampling um, and the copyrights and 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 all that. And somebody was giving you pushback about, you know, well, this and this and this and this. And um, I, I added to your uh, your post about um, sampling the, the actual master versus just uh, interpolation. Yep, interpolations. Just, you know, and, and um, in that instant, I added to what you said about it. With, uh, you know, if it's just an interpolation, it's just a publishing deal. You don't have to, uh, you didn't sample from the master direct. So you don't have to clear it with the master side of it. You just clear the publishing side of you. And, and, and I've, I've been on both sides of that where I've had to clear, uh, one of my older, uh, records, uh, Lotto, for instance sampled uh well it's an interpolation of gucci man um vet passed by uh so she didn't have to get clearance from the master side but she had to clear it with on the publishing side with me and gucci um and uh other situations with uh you know um me having to clear several of my records um all interpolations nothing from the from the from the master but you know, that day, um, you opened a big can of worms that I saw most newer producers or, or aspiring producers have no idea, no idea how it works. It's a shame. Um, I, I, I don't really have a magic bullet for not just the lack of knowledge, but the fact that it appears... I don't know. I think I think newer producers don't like being told and then they kind of look at people like us like parents, like we're telling you what to do. And it's like, no, we're just we're in the same way a parent is telling you, hey, you're 15. Don't get drunk and steal a car. Right. And then you're like, oh, fuck that. I'm going to go get drunk and steal a car. You you don't run me. It's kind of the same. And then they come back and they're like, yeah, I got drunk, stole a car, went to jail. My life is ruined. Can you help me? And it's like. Like, Didn't no. I tell you so? It, it's I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just an interesting phenomenon to to experience, you know. Because I don't you you'd think you'd want to learn this stuff because it would it, it helps you, but then again, people just want to rebel against who they see as an authority figure, and it's like I'm yeah. not an authority yeah. figure, bro. I'm one of you. Yeah. I'm I've just made those mistakes before right. you did. Right. So I'm telling you what's going on. The authority, the people you got to rebel against are the ones that are going to take advantage of you for being ignorant. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, it happens. It happens every day. Um, and and I'm, I'm I'm coming from uh, the aspect, just a uh, uh, same side of it as you. Uh, I'm trying to when I can, I'm trying to limit, you know, because it, it's, it's, it's one thing just going back to the parent reference. It's one thing, you know. Parents that prepare their children, um, they, they've given them all the information that they can. And however the information was, was received, that information is always in the back of their head. And that's the difference in a well-informed child versus a not-so-well-informed child bumping their heads. Every child is going to make their mistakes when they go out into the real world. The difference is the child with the information um, from their parents is just going to get a knot on their head. 
the child not so that either didn't receive the information or never got it is going to give themselves concussion. And that's the difference. You know what I'm saying? If you have information, you lessen the blow. You're going to still going to make your mistakes, but you have you have the information to know how to navigate it. Or once you see it up close in person. Oh, yeah. My dad told me about that. And, and, and you know, the. The, the blow to the head is not so, you know, you don't give yourself a concussion and knock yourself all the way completely out. Um, so whenever I see that, um, especially, on, you know, uh, you and um, Sonny Digital, Sonny's always putting some good information out there. And I see a lot of people give him pushback. It's like, man, it's like we, 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 we do this, man. We've done this. We've made some of the mistakes that. You guys haven't even made yet, and I can tell you haven't made it yet because the answer that you just gave is the answer that's leading straight into a mistake, and it's going to be costly for you. You know, so don't 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 look at what Payne is saying or what Sonny is saying or, or what Fat Boy is saying as we're trying to tell you what to, what to do. We're trying to steer you in the right direction, so you don't. You don't miss opportunities when they're presented to you and you can get this done the right way the first time. You know, I think everybody looking at it as somebody's going to steal their money at every chance they get. But, yeah, if you go into this situation uninformed, they definitely going to steal your money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's just funny to be skeptical of someone like Sonny Digital, who's already for all intents and purposes made it and he's just giving away free information people are like i don't trust that how he has no incentive free there's no, no ulterior motives he's not getting paid whether yeah. or not you listen to him he's right. just doing it because he knows what it is he's lived it already he's lived um, it so switching gears speaking of people who've lived it you you have a lot of number ones a lot of top fives a lot of plaques i, I don't know if we can count them um but just going through your resume uh one thing i noticed on the Monica album, you're the only producer on that album that that's, has a solo credit. Everyone else, including legends like Timberland and, and Polo the Don, collaboratively produced those records. But yeah. your your list is just proud by Fatboy. Um, what was the process of making that beat? Because that's a real R and B beat too. Oh man, um, it's 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 crazy. You even brought that one up because there is a story to that. Um, I actually uh, did it for um, Best Man Holiday. Uh, that, that's 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 what it was initially for, and it was going to be, you know, um, if you're familiar with that movie, it was a holiday movie, a Christmas Christmas movie. Um, so all the songs in that movie were holiday songs, um, and Jive did the did the soundtrack. Um, so it was all it was all their artists, Chris Brown, Usher, Monica. Um, and that particular record, Usher, um, the uh, the the uh, production uh, manager, the absolutely music um, production manager, absolutely loved that record. And it was going to be the only record um, to not be a holiday record and come at the end credit uh when you know after the funeral the guy buries his wife um and usher didn't he didn't he didn't cut the record for for whatever reason I, I can't remember what it was um so i ended up playing it for monica and she loved it um but basically that record was uh um uh, my sister tammy uh latrell um she came to me with the idea to do it and we just went into the studio. I, I booked out patchwork for maybe like a week or so. Um, and just slowly, one by one, pieced the record together. I got all my musicians in there, a uh, guitar player, uh, my, my, one, one of my trusted uh, studio musicians, um, Dan Marshall, did all the guitar parts. Uh, my top uh, piano guy, uh, P. Spry, Prentice Spry, did all the piano parts, um, and several writers that I that I uh, my trusted writers, uh, Atazio, uh, Tammy Latrell, um, they all went in and and penned it, 
And uh, Monica and her manager, they 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 loved it. And after that, you know, we 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 cut it. But that process, man, that was a process. Um, it took a week. It took a week to actually create the track and write to it. And it took about a week to cut it with Monica. So, uh, but yeah, that that was that was a yeah that that was a that was a great experience. I was the only producer on that. On that, uh, I think the whole album, everybody else kind of partnered up. That that's a good lesson too, because you'll be right at the finish line with a placement, yeah, and then things will change. So so before you, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. So you had the record already done, yeah, and it was initially meant as a male reference, and that's why Usher was going to cut it, or did Tammy Latrell rewrite it for Monica? Uh, no, no. Um, Atazio cut the cut the demo, so it was the a male, it was it was a male vocal. Okay. Um, yeah, it was a it was a male vocal first. Um, so you know whoever was going, whether it was Chris or or or, or Usher, but it was it went to Usher, uh, and Usher uh, Usher went with a a uh, holiday record instead of that record. So. Um, every everybody did actually. I I can't remember the uh, what ended up taking that place of that record, but uh, yeah, it was initially um, it was cut by by Atazio, so it was it was referenced for a male. Uh, and when Monica took it, um, she still uh, she cut the exact version the exact version the way it is. Uh, only she only thing she did was did her Monica runs and and stuff like that. Uh, but I brought um, Atazio and Tammy to vocal producer. Uh, so when we went into the studio, both of them were in the studio uh, working with her. Okay, so they handled a lot of the harmonies and the stacks yeah. and all that vocal. Production. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah that that's also I good. Also did as well. Um, but uh, so it was it was a collaborative effort across the board. Um, if there's something that I wanted Monica to do. Uh, I just hey Mo, try it, try it like this, try it like that. Um, it it may have been, it may have been some extra things um, that weren't in the uh, the demo version uh, that we added for specifically for Monica. But the meat and potatoes of it uh, was was already there. She 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 cut the record uh, as as is. The way we presented it to her, and then she put her sprinkles on top of it, including the uh, the choir. It is it, it sounds like it's a choir in it, but the choir is actually myself, Atazio, uh, Mike White, and one other guy doing all the parts. So and would you you just stood it far away from the mic at, on some takes and closer on some takes to create yeah a choir effect? Okay, that, yeah, see, yeah. that's that's fun. I feel like that's the fun of producing I, I love making beats um but then when you take it to the next step and you start doing vocal production like there's there's beat production there's tracking there's all that yeah, yeah. vocal production is fun and, and there are so okay. many vocal production geniuses out there that can yeah. bring out such amazing stuff out of artists have you ever had it this has happened to me i'm not gonna i'm not gonna get into details have you ever had a situation where you've made a beat you, um, a singer, songwriter demos the track. You get it placed with a big artist, and their version is way worse than the demo. Oh man, all the time, uh, <laughs> all the time. It, it's uh, and 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 I, I'm gl I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because that's a that's a thing that I've uh, I mean, and just recently, uh, artists that I work with. Uh, I try to get them to, you know, my thing is, look, when I get when, when when I played the record for you, you liked the record for what it was. So let's cut the record the way it is. And then after that, we can make it yours. You know, like whatever your thing is that you do. Now we'll come back and sprinkle that thing in. But initially, what made you like the record? Let's cut it. That way, which is why the Michael Jacksons, uh, the Beyonce's, the Whitney Houston's of the world, uh, the Luther Vandross's of the world. That's why they're they, they, they stay 
on their purchase and, and, and are hard to knock off because when they do get a record that somebody else wrote, they perform it the way that writer wrote it. You know, especially if it's somebody, if the demo is somebody who can really sing. They perform the record that way. And, and, I, and, and when I say that, I mean from how they pronounce certain words, little nuances in the record and everything. You know, if, uh, if, if the person said, uh, wow, they're going to sing it. Wow. Just like them. Whatever's in that record, they're going to capture what they liked about the essence of that record. And then they come back. You know, if it's Michael Jackson, then he's going to come back and add the hee hee and, and, and all that stuff after the fact. But he's going to sing it exactly how you did it. And, and that's one thing I don't understand about a lot of uh, newer artists today is like, OK, you're taking the demo and you're taking what you actually liked about the demo out of it. And you're turning it into, I know nobody has heard it, but the record is not, prime example, I did a, a LMA record last year, uh, This Is, um, and it had an interpolation of a Shalimar sample in that record, um, but LMA performed the record exactly how my writer wrote the record, exactly, exactly caught everything about the record and when the record came out i mean it's it's man it's it's the record the only the only thing ella did was she added uh she added a pre to the record and her pre was perfect it didn't take away anything from the record it added to it um made it even better um but the main performance of the record the hook the verses she did the bridge she did exactly the way my writer wrote it and that's why the record you know ended up becoming a single off of the deluxe and and was on radio what you don't have to tell me details of this but so you you produce a lma record you interpolate a shalomar sample i'm guessing from that from some one of their 1980 yep. early 80s albums yeah uh got that cleared and you Sorry, say that again. This is for the lover in you. Oh, okay. Was that an expensive clearance? Did you have to take a big hit on the equity in the record that that you got? Now that record, being being that it's it's one of Shalimar's um, most popular records, yeah, it's up there. Um, Shalimar ended up. Well, Howard Hewitt and I think it's two writers on the record, Howard Hewitt and uh, Dana, Dana Myers. Um, they ended up taking 60 percent of the record, which 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 was to be expected. I, I knew the whole, the whole thing, including LMA's part, everything. Yeah, 60, 60 flat across the board. OK, across the board, 60. Howard Hewitt has some amazing solo music, too. So I, yeah, I guess it's to be expected 60 oh, damn 60 seems like a lot i know 50 they do a lot of times i tried to get it at 50 i tried to get it at 50 but at the same time it's like i, I also uh, and see th this is the thing too knowingly going into that record i knew what i did i but it was on purpose it was purpose you know i knew what i did i i actually i made the track myself in uh peace spry um that played the keys on the monica record um, I did it during COVID, 2020. Um, but everybody that I played the record for, um, they couldn't get the original out of their head. Um, so my writer, oh, at the time, yeah, I just, see where this is going. Yep. Yes, yeah, so they kept capturing the the, the original. Um, my writer was only 22 years old at the time, so she didn't grow up with that record the way I did. Uh, that was a record my mom played every Saturday when we were cleaning up. So um, her not knowing anything, not not having a, a, a connection to that record like me, all I did was just point her in the direction of the melody that I wanted her to capture, which is which was the this is and then the rest do you. Um, but going into it, I knew what that was going to be. You know, I, I knew I knew I could take an expensive hit on that record. 
Um, but the record was a great record. So I, I wasn't really tripping about that because knowingly I already knew what it was. Um, could have been even worse if I'd have directly sampled it from the master. Um, but being, being an interpolation, it ended up being 60, 40 split and I wasn't mad at it, you know, going into it, you know, I, I would have rather it been 50, 50, but it didn't end up 50 and ended up 60. But, you know, uh, for that to come out, it, it, it ended up, you know, how it did. Out of that 40 remaining percent, you still got a piece of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were cool about it because a lot of times labels will just pass it all the way on to the producer and say, okay, cool. You would have gotten 50%, but since they're taking 60, that 50 is coming out of your pocket. Out, out of your pocket. Yes. So it, it, it wasn't that. It was a breakdown. Uh, we, we we cut it down to, you know, my writer, uh, LMA, um, myself, and DJ Mustard. And we just we just broke it down. So so is that partially because DJ Mustard had some pretty good legal resources that would fight for that equity? Was it your your publishing admin that that fought for you? Was it a lawyer? No, that was that was actually just me and Mustard. That was just that was just me and Mustard. It's like yeah, we'll we'll all just you know uh, the remaining forty we'll we'll bust the forty up. Shalomar's you know we can't get Shalomar to move on the sixty, uh, and and we'll we'll bust up the forty. So, okay, because yeah, Mustard is involved in LMA's career beyond just a producer, and yeah, yeah. coming from a producer's perspective, Mustard is gonna be more equitable when it comes to to sample clearance. Okay, so that's it's good to have a producer in these executive positions. Yeah, because awesome. a lot of executives are just all about their bottom line. Yeah, they, don't, yeah. they don't care yeah. about producers. Absolutely, and, and and it was it was it was I mean it was fairly uh it was fairly quick. Um, there was no hiccups, no hangups. Shalom, you know, Howard was, you know, no issues with Howard. Um, and, and I'm not saying that it was an issue with the 50 or the 60. Um, but that was the only thing that I, uh, tried to fight for. And it, and it really wasn't even a fight. Like I wasn't going to like, no 50, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was, a I, I, I shot for the 50, uh, they leaned in on the 60 and that was it. Um, I let it go after that. Um, Interscope sent all the paperwork over to me. I, you know, uh, put all the players that were involved, um, all the credits, um, the Shalomar credits, you know, where everything came from, turned it back in and like that clockwork. And that was a, that was a plaque, right? Uh, not yet. Uh, it, it's 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 approaching, but it, it hasn't uh it hasn't been official yet. Um, but uh, oh yeah, I love having that stuff just hanging in the air where you know damn well it's so it's it's already gold or platinum or whatever, and they just haven't paid the the auditing fee for the RIAA. Yeah, yeah, I got right. Well, you know, well. so um, at, at at any, I'm waiting on it at any. You know, I'm I'm, I'm checking I'm checking RIAA every day. It's like today, 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 today. You know, so I, I I know it's I, I know it's coming, uh, so I'm not tripping about that. And the setup the setup of it was good. It was perfect. It was perfectly timed. It's a it's a lovers record. So uh, when they released it, it was uh, Grammy Grammy week, but also Valentine's Day week. So uh, the setup the, the setup was perfect. And and she had um, for Grammys. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, one of the, one of the uh, it's not Ciroc, um, but one of the um, one of the uh, liquor companies uh did their their thing um Grammy Week thing, and she did a uh an acoustic performance of it leading up to the release of it and all that. So you know, setup was perfect, you know. And I'm not gonna man to be honest, it's probably one of the quickest records i've ever gotten done um the logistics of it you know especially especially dealing with the with the sample it's like oh man this like this was just bow bow boom bing done <laughs> just like that you know no no hiccups no hitches no nothing no pushback from anybody it was just uh it was just everybody was on board with it including shalomar <laughs> 